life experience of living in a family house and designing houses that are both beautiful, comfortable, and adaptable. We're going to ask Gil Schaefer about these books, his work, his design philosophy, and a new chapter in his firm's 23-year history, which involves a full-circle, home-at-last merger with new partners. Welcome, Gil Schaefer. Well, I'm so glad to be here, Peter. So nice to, uh, to see you. I was thinking, uh, I was thinking this morning that you and I have probably known each other for close to 25 years now. And we suffered through that, that dreaded recession of 2009. Yes, we did. I remember having a commiserative breakfast back then. <laughs> we both, we both did, couldn't quite see the future, but it was a scary time. It turns out, uh, things turned out just fine. Okay, I'm going to ask you first, Gil, to tell me about your new book, Home at Last, which describes a little bit of the kind of work I just talked about. Sure. Um, well, I think it, it, it kind of follows the, um, the format of the prior two, and uh, I guess I kind of thought of this most recent one as being like the third in, a, in the three-part series about the firm's work over the last 20 years. Um, and I guess like the first two, it's kind of personal. Um, I kind of draw my work, the work that I do draws so much from my own life experience. And, uh, and so I wanted to kind of tap into that for this book and look at the work we're doing now and how the changes in life affect the work that I do. And, and um, I got married in the last five years and I had stepchildren and sort of had a, had a new kind of insight into family life in a way that I didn't have before that I think enriched my uh, my point of view as an architect. Um, and then we just, we look at more projects that we've done over the last five years, um, eight different houses around the country. So I'm excited for people to see it. Let me guess, the children have taught you how to deal with chaos. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, uh, that life is messy. It's not um, a perfectly uh, curated, styled photo shoot kind of room anymore. <laughs> and we had COVID too, which was oh my goodness. A kind of another dimension and being together as a family, which was amazing, I think, for all of us uh, to be together. But it, but it was also like a crash course in the messiness of life. And <laughs> um, I had I had ducklings in my living room in, in upstate and, and a dragon lizard and a dragon lizard tank and gaming computers and all sorts of stuff that every parent deals with, but it was new to me, and it was, uh, it was kind of an awesome education. And you've survived it. Your great-grandfather and your grandfather were both architects, so you must have known at an early age that you would be one too. So in your, in your second book, A Place to Call Home, you talk about how the places you lived in as a kid influenced your design sensibility. You want to talk more about that? Yeah, my grandfather and his grandfather were both architects. Um, and, and I was wired from the earliest memories to be interested in buildings and building things. So I'm sure it's genetic and, uh, and I kind of had a predetermined destiny, I think. Um, and it was, so it was always interesting. And also I had two parents who loved to build things. They were always, there was always some kind of construction project going on. So I was always around that growing up. Um, and I was, Unlike my brother, who has no interest in architecture in particular, <laughs> I was very um, intrigued by all of that. Um, and then we moved around a fair bit. So I saw different houses in different places and and the ways that they were different one from the other. Um, and that was I was really tuned into that for for whatever genetic reason. <laughs> and um, and I think that's really informed my work now because I actually love to work in different places and I like to try to key into whatever's particular to that place and try to make a house that relates to that. I know you've spent some time in Ohio. I'm in Ohio as we speak in a little town mm. called Granville, which is some yeah. of the prettiest Greek revival you ever saw. Really cute historic town from the early yeah. 1800s. So most architects write a book because it's good PR. But my sense is that it's more than that for you, that you are at heart an educator, and that this, this is certainly evidenced by your early involvement with the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, uh, classical education institution. Now you have written three books, 
uh, which do much more than show your firm's work. How do you come by your willingness to teach? Hmm. Um, well, I'm, I'm not a, a legitimate educator the way my two partners, Amy and Kevin Busilato are, uh, who both taught at Notre Dame. But, but I think that what was so instrumental in my own growth as an architect was the willingness of people around me to share what they knew. I was really lucky to work in environments where people really shared what they knew. And, and that's, and you know, I went, you know, I went to Yale for architecture school, but I was really trained to be a modernist, not a classicist. And so where I really learned about classical architecture, you know, in a more academic way was in the offices I worked in. And so I think I learned early in my professional life that, you know, that if you share knowledge in a, in a kind of way that I guess makes you kind of an educator, that um, that's enormously helpful. And so I guess I kind of that kind of informed the way that I wanted to run my own firm. Um, and then when I sat down to write books about our work, I guess I wanted to share what I had learned and what I thought about the ways to approach houses that, that could be useful for anyone, not just you know, probably more for someone who's a client, you know, potential client, or a lot of people who read our the books I've written are not necessarily going to be clients. They're doing their own projects. They're either they're working with a builder or their own architect, and they just are interested in the way that we've looked at the projects we've done and how we've solved those problems. So it's been it's, I've always tried to approach those books as a way to kind of share what we know. Well, how did you know you wanted to be? A classicist, not that I want to pigeonhole you because you're an architect, but <laughs> yeah, but you went to school, you learned modernism. Did you were you bristling at school? Hey, when are they going to let me draw by hand or anything like that? <laughs> no, I, I think, um, well, of course, growing up around my grandfather, an architect, I had a stepmother who was a decorator, I had parents who loved architecture and houses and interiors, and so I just grew up around architecture, but mostly traditional architecture. And so that to me felt very much at home. I felt at home in that. And then when I went to Yale, it was, I, I didn't understand that architecture was in camps at that time. Like there was, you know, the camp of those people who believed that architecture expressed its time. It was of its time, which meant it was looking ahead and now and not looking at the past. And then there were the, the architecture that people looked back at what came before and use that to inspire the work. And so at Yale, I, they, they kind of said, well, no, no, you need to be looking ahead, not back. And that was kind of shocking initially, but I thought, well, okay, let's see, let's learn what there is to learn about that. And then I got out of school and realized that my, my soul was kind of in that work, the, the work that had history to it, had some history to it. And, um, and so that, made me kind of switch gears from working in a firm that was very modern to firms that were more traditional. And, um, and that really kind of, that gave me my education back into classicism, even though I think my sensibility was that way from the beginning, from, from the youngest age, because of the way I grew up. You remember Clem Levine? Yes, of course. <laughs> we interviewed him for this podcast a few weeks ago and I asked him, so what's the old house lover like? And he said, mm. they're nurturing people. They're people uh -huh. who like to nurture. I thought that was a great, a great way to look at it. So yeah. speaking of teaching, you're joined now by two new partners, architects, yeah. both teachers at Notre Dame. Now, now they've joined your firm as partners, Amy and Kevin yeah. Busalato. Yeah. Now I'm guessing yeah. that I'm guessing they share your commitment to teaching. Um, tell us more about this new, this new partnership, this new collaboration. Yeah. Well, of course they, they were, that were teachers in a very serious way. Amy was tenured at Notre Dame um, and they've been enormously committed to teaching um, and uh, which is something that, and then they value education and, and always creating an environment of learning, which was something that was very appealing to me and important to me um, as in, in, a, in partners because we have that same value here at our firm as they do at theirs. Um, and I, I don't know if you know this, but Amy, Amy was my first employee when I started my company 20 some odd years ago. Home at last. <laughs> Home at last. And, and Kevin, her husband, followed shortly thereafter. And they were really responsible for helping me set up my firm and get going, get it going and, and manage our earliest projects and be, were their leaders in the firm. And then they went out to Notre Dame to teach. And, and so it was 
it's really thrilling to me to have them come back to kind of join their business with mine and um, to have younger energy. <laughs> you know, I'm in my 60s. I think it's great to have people who are, you know, uh, experienced but but younger, um, you know, as co-leaders. And I have another partner, Lou Taylor, who's also sort of a contemporary of theirs. And he, Lou runs the, the business side of the business, which is such an important facet to having a successful firm. And that's probably another podcast for us. But um, uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm thrilled to have them with us here in New York and yeah, I'm excited to see what we're going to do together again. I'm sure they appreciate your mentorship. So speaking of which, which, what kind of advice do you give emerging professionals in architecture and interiors? Hmm. Well, I think, I mean, something that I say to younger people a lot is that we, we live in an age, it's, it's the thing that drives me bananas about Instagram is that everything is fast. Like you're looking at things, uh, you know, for five, 10 seconds at a time. And, and I like to encourage people to look slowly and that I think that that's how I learned that I looked at images. That's why I'm a, I know I'm a dinosaur, but I love books. I love magazines because you can sit and really, first of all, the image is bigger and you can sit and look at it for a while and study it, um, which is kind of the antithesis of what we're encouraged to do on Instagram, which is to look at an image, and scroll up and go to the next and go to the next and go to the next. And you don't really look deeply. And I think that's so important to understand, particularly if you're trying to understand history or precedent, to look carefully and deeply and slowly. Um, and that's why we have a library is so important in our company. It's actually, it's physically the spine of the office. It runs down the whole length of the space. Um, and it's, it's the spine physically and metaphorically for our mm -hmm. business. Um, so to, uh, to look, to always be looking and to look carefully and slowly and deeply and study precedent. You know what comes to mind when you say that, Gil, is uh, the importance of hand drawing because you're mm. you're looking more deeply, you're seeing better. Yes, and I'm a guy who loves. I was never I was never a brilliant uh, draftsman in terms of drawing freehand like like some of my colleagues are, but but um, I love to take pictures. But but you're absolutely right that when you sit and draw a molding or a space, you you have to. You have to learn it, and it connects in your brain in a really particular way that is so useful and important. We're actually launching a new competition alongside of Palladio called the Raphael Awards, which will celebrate hand drawing, watercolor, oh, wow. watercolor rendering. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's I mean, it's, amazing. I'm so glad you're doing that. It's going to make for a great magazine story because it's so pretty. Well, for sure. But and there's so much talent out there that that does that well I, I, that's super exciting i'm i'm so glad you're doing that you know we uh i i sit on a number of juries for competitions and there's always a student category and it's never work that's been built it's work that's proposed the drawings and the art and the renderings are I unbelievable i know a lot of it comes from notre dame by the way yeah yeah but they're but the, but the, it's it's spreading all around the country which is so exciting i mean i think when when we were first getting the Institute going, that was the dream, uh, the Institute of Classic Ar Ar Classical Architecture. And now it's really it's happening. It's all over. Let's, let's talk about the Institute of Cla Classical Architecture and Art, which you had a hand in launching back in the day. Uh, a lot of people think we're the style police, that if it doesn't have, huh. a, if it doesn't have a column, it's wrong. But in <laughs> fact, it's about education, right? Yes. I mean, that's at least... You know, I was involved with it for many years, and that was certainly, and I believe it's true today, that was the, the, the core value of the, of the organization is education and, and it giving, providing that knowledge that had been kind of set aside and dismissed by a lot of the academy, you know, in, in quotes, um, architecture schools in general around the country and to give access to that knowledge again. And it doesn't mean that you have to be a classicist, but I think it's really important to understand those principles so that even if you're going to reject them or to or to transform them in some way, if you understand the correct way of, that it was done, you can make it a more informed 
I think, a more elegant design. I, I mean, you think about Mies van der Rohe or Picasso, they, uh, they were educated in the classics before they transformed that language. And you think about any musician, what's so amazing is that in, in music education, you, you study the whole range of what hit that history was. Whereas in architecture education, it's kind of okay to dismiss a lot of the history. Right. I agree with you. In fact, it, when I'm talking to lay people about architecture, classicism, I, I say just exactly what you said. It's, you know, you, you learn classical music so that you can be a good jazz musician. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've designed houses and renovations all over the country. Uh, do you want to tell us about any of the projects that are particularly memorable? I, I should also add that some of the building sites that you're on, whether it's overlooking Lake Champlain or the Pacific Ocean, are pretty amazing. But do you have those that uh, – I know you love all your children equally, but do you have those that, <laughs> <laughs> that stand out in your memory? I, I think that – I think the projects that stand out are the ones that challenge you in a new way, or at least as I've gotten older, that's what I look for. I look for something that I haven't done before, uh, or that, um, it's just, you know, it's maybe it's in a different place, a different, um, setting, a different kind of site, a different, um, a different problem to solve. I think that, uh, uh, I always think that when a project scares me a little, because I don't immediately know how to solve the problem, that's a really good thing now, you know, and, and I don't really want to do the same thing over and over. So, um, and, and, you know, there's a few of those in the, in the book or, uh, that's coming out, um, hopefully that, that look a little different and hopefully different from each other. Um, uh, the one for the house that, um, uh, just won the Palladio award this summer, which is a kind of English style house, stone house in the Hudson Valley. Um, that was, you know, it was trying to, you know, we do a lot of vernacular work, but this had to be a little more high style classical. And that was really fun. Um, we just finished uh, a project on the coast of Maine. Uh, that's also in the book uh, coming up that um, was a, the restoration of a landmarked boathouse uh, built in 1904 on a, on the harbor of a town in Maine. And uh, it was built to house a 105 foot steam yacht from, you know, the turn of the century Yikes. and uh and it was falling down when our clients bought it and and as they asked us to kind of transform it or reimagine it so that they could put a hinkley boat in half of it and then have living space in the other half um and it was technically a really hard interesting challenge like filling half the building with water and the other half with living space <laughs> oh and have God. a glass wall between the two um and restore it exactly as it had been in 1904 from the outside, but make something different on the inside. So that that was just that's an example of the kind of thing that excites me now. You mean you hadn't <laughs> done a, a 1904 boathouse before? <laughs> I never had, and so you know that's so anything that that's new and different, that's a different language because I love to learn a different language of architecture, whether it's you know doing a restoring a Victorian house, which I had we've been doing recently. So it's a completely different language of design. Do you always start with context and a place? I, I do. I mean, I'm really interested in what makes the house feel inevitable. Um, and when we do a restoration, I like to be kind of invisible about it. You know, mm -hmm. not rather than saying, look at this, this is different from that. I like to say, can you not find the line between where we were and where the old thing was? Um, yeah, when I hear the expression architecture of its time, I say, yeah, but what about architecture of its place? Yeah, well, but yes, but I think I think it can be both. I think that, you know, obviously the way we're going to, any of us is going to do classicism now is going to be of its time because it's going to have different kinds of demands on it. And that's what I love about the classical language is it's so adaptable, actually. You know, it's a language that you learn to speak and then you can, you can write all kinds of books with it. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it's not just one thing. What do you think of the ubiquitous modern farmhouse? <laughs> well, <laughs> having done a lot of farmhouses built today, I, I, uh, I mean, it's it's now it's a cliche, isn't it? It's kind of it's kind of disappointing, and, and it's right. really run it's run its course about very it. quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. white clabbered with black sash windows. With yeah. black sash windows, I know. Yeah. It's just so sad because yeah. anything that is legitimately that is now ruined. Yeah, because it's become a cliche. <laughs> Well, at least it has a steep gable roof, which is which is pretty to look at. Yeah. Uh, any other projects in the book you want to tell us about? And by the way, when does the book come out? 
and it comes out in March, the beginning of March next year, 2024. Um, and it has, um, it has a couple houses in, uh, on the coast in Florida. Um, it has some projects in Maine, um, uh, one in the Hudson Valley. Where, where in Florida? Palm Beach? Uh, on that coast, on the east coast east of Florida. East coast? Yeah. yeah. Is it Floridian? Yeah, I'd say Caribbean, maybe. Uh-huh. I don't know. Florida, Florida now is anything, right? Yeah. It's like anything and everything. Yeah. So, it, but I would say it was more West Indian and Caribbean influenced. That sounds uh, nice. Are you going to do a book so, tour? Yeah, yeah, I think so. We'll go around and I'll talk a bit if anyone wants to listen. <laughs> the last time I heard you speak was at Mesda in Winston oh, wow. Salem. Remember that? That was a while ago. Yeah, yeah that was fun. And uh, yeah. But I remember you saying something that I have quoted ever since, which is um, magazine editors always ask me, what's new? What's hot? What's trendy? Of course, I'm a magazine editor, right? So I'm leaning yeah. in, listening carefully. And you say, you know, that's not really what I do. <laughs> I'm a classicist. Yeah. I thought, note to self, don't ever <laughs> ask Gil what's new, trendy, and hot. <laughs> well, it, it's just, I'll give you a really, I don't have a good answer. That's the problem. Um, Cause I tend to try to think about what's, what will endure uh, rather than what's the latest thing. Right. Back to the Instagram metaphor. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 You can't swipe your finger across this house and have it go to the next one. Well, this one's going to be. I mean, you can, but it may not be, you may not learn as much. I don't know. <laughs> right. Right. Well, this has been fun, Gil. I knew it would be. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. I'm Pete Miller, and you're listening to Building Tradition, brought to you by Traditional Building Magazine. Subscribe on Apple Podcast or wherever you get your podcast. Thank you.